This is the Billy T. Detroit Radio Podcast. Kyrie <laughs> Turner is in the building. Yo, Kyrie, What's happening, man? Yo, folks get serious when I walk in. Yes, man. yes, <laughs> you are a serious guy. How you doing, brother? I'm good, man. It's good to see y'all. You man. too, man. Good to hey, see this you. This feels bro. like a family reunion. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the whole idea. Yeah. That's what's up. I like it. I like All it. right. So what's been happening, man? Uh, man. Now, now let's just let everybody know. You are the uh, president of the Coleman Young Foundation. Yep. Executive director. Executive yeah. director. Yeah. Some people might remember the Black Bottom Collective. Yes, sir. Your, yes, your sir. music group that made some great music. Yeah. Yeah. And we're back. And we're back? Yeah, we're back, man. You know, we got back together last year after a nine-year hiatus. Wow. uh, Yeah, so I'm the only executive director rocking the mic in the city right now. So (laughs) it's kind of cool. And you also did a big thing uh, within the last year or so, uh, the TED Talk. Yeah, here in TEDx Detroit. Detroit, that was awesome. Man. I, uh, I I watched it. It's uh, it's an interesting little talk, and you talked about Coleman Young, yeah. being an icon. Yeah, that was uh, that was incredible because um, I applied to do this TED talk, and and you know I wanted to talk about education because I you know I run a scholarship foundation, so mm-hmm. they came back and they said you know well eighty five percent of us like the idea of you doing a talk about education, but one hundred and ten percent of us want you to talk about Coleman Young. Really, and we want you to go first. Wow. So we're in the Fox Theater with 3,000 people, most of whom may not necessarily be from the city or may be the the children of the folks who didn't necessarily care for the mayor. Ah. Um, So they wanted me to start the day off, kind of a calibration guy. Mm -hmm. And, man, it was was outstanding. You know, we kind of talked about Mayor Young's love for the city Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, how the things he did for the city, it wasn't, it wasn't, he didn't do things for people to like him. Right. You know, he wanted to move the city forward so that me, you and TJ could be sitting here having these kind of conversations today. That's right. And, you know, and you got to ask the question, you know, if he didn't do some of the things he did, if he didn't call Mike Illich when he was building the the Little Caesars headquarters in Farmington Hills mm-hmm. and say, look, if I help you get a hold of the Fox, will you renovate and bring this thing back to life? Would we be looking at the entertainment district that we're looking at? And that's today? what happened. Now, he didn't own the Fox at first. I mean, no, no, uh, it was it was owned by. OK, so a little history. It was owned history. by uh, Mr. Forbes, my former landlord. And he today still owns the Palms Theater. I mean, the Palms Building, which is where the Fillmore Theater is. Right. OK. Yeah. Still operates it. 80, 88 years old. So shout, so shout out to Mr. Forbes uh, and his family. He sold it to Illich. Illich renovated it. It becomes the cornerstone, and up around it springs Comerica Park, and now the new stadium, and uh, the Pistons end up relocating back downtown. Ford Field comes up, and now Detroit has, like, literally the biggest entertainment district east of the Mississippi, short of New York City. Really? That's us. Bigger than Chicago? Bigger than Chicago. Really? District. See, when people think about Chicago, they think about what, Magnificent Mile? Yeah. A couple spots. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Granted, Chicago is a much larger city. Right. But in terms of a single district dedicated to entertainment, mm-hmm. no, that's us. Wow. It's New York City, Detroit, Michigan. Amazing. Yeah. We're live with Kyrie Turner in the studio, yeah. and we're talking about the Coleman Young Foundation, and we'll be talking about all the other things that he is into at this time. Yeah. And uh, if you have some questions and want to talk to Kyrie, you can uh, call us at 313-568-1200. So uh, the, the, the Coleman Young Foundation, you've been uh, running that now for a couple of years? Since 2012. Oh, wow. Yeah, they brought me on board in 2012, man. Um, um, funny story. I was, I was working in, in for-profit education and wanted to come back to the nonprofit sector. Uh-huh. Watch that CNN documentary, uh, Black in America, the one where they dealt with finance. Mm-hmm. They told a story about a cat who uh, spent a year and a half out of work because he never went to his church and asked anybody if they knew about who was hiring. As soon mm. as he did, he ended up working for a small finance company as a vice president. So I took a look. I he took started a, working as a vice president? Yeah, they hired him <laughs> in as a vice president. Wow. You know, so I, I saw that story just as I was deciding that I wanted to put myself back out there in the market. And I did that. I went to church the next uh, Sunday, uh, talked to Marvin Beatty, who goes to my same church, Fellowship mm-hmm. Chapel. Mr. Beatty, I'm putting myself in the market. I, I figured I'd be the smart brother and do it while I'm still employed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. And he said, yeah, I do have something opening. And and he asked me to, to hold tight until the outgoing... Uh, uh, executive director retired, Claudette Smith, mm-hmm. who became my mentor and friend. Okay. And it became a perfect, seamless onboarding process, brother. So I've been there since 2012. I, like many people, didn't realize that the Coleman and Young Foundation's work is as profound as it is. How many elected officials' foundations are still around 35 years after they retire and, and or leave office and 20 years after they pass away? Okay. Um, Mayor Young took 
the last three million dollars of his money. Mm-hmm. So we all we all have these rumors about what Mayor <laughs> Young had and did. That man died living in a one bedroom apartment with almost nothing. Wow. Because he took the remaining three million dollars of his wealth, which was in his in his war chest, you know, the capital. Yeah. The, I mean, not the capital, but the campaign funds. You could retire on that money back then. OK. He took half of it and gave it to Wayne State University and created the Coleman Young uh, position, the the endowed chair professorship. OK. Um, which I had the honor of helping to to fill uh, that seat just two years ago. And with the remaining portion, he endowed the Coleman A. Young Foundation. Since then, Billy. We've put uh, just about 500 Detroit kids from Detroit schools and Detroit neighborhoods through college, awarding scholarships that are valued up to $22,000. And we mentor these kids all the way through college. So we're not just a take the money and and wish you well kind Mm -hmm. of organization. Mm -hmm. We mentor these kids, man. And and our graduation rate since 1995 is 91%. College wow. graduation rate. Amazing. Yeah. So if we put it in perspective, you know, we are Detroiters. That's Detroit right. neighborhoods aren't necessarily breeding grounds for college going individuals, but we are, our neighborhoods are breeding grounds for hungry people. We, we've we seen in our work that when you simply apply some care, concern, and, and consistent follow through, uh, in, our, in our case, it's a systematic mentoring program to that hunger, our kids just flourish, man. Ninety-one percent of these kids have graduated. Sixty percent of them came back to the city to live, work, raise families, and and that's the work we do. We also work with eleven to eighteen year olds. We have a free youth development program, uh, and we've been going strong now for thirty-five years. We're getting wow. re- we're getting ready to celebrate our new class of scholars in, on May eighth. Wow! Uh, yeah, amazing. Yeah, and what do you see? The city is refurbished. It's yeah. growing. It's it's changing. Mm-hmm. What do you see for the city of Detroit in the near future? Uh, uh, do you like what you see? Uh, what's going on? Well, I, I would definitely rather see what's happening happen than not. Okay. You know, I, no, nobody wanted the city to remain in the condition that it was in. Right. That said, I think Detroiters need to have as strong or as much of a stake in the city's future as possible. Mm-hmm. It's one of the reasons I'm so proud to do the work that we do because mm-hmm. we're, we're literally serving as, as a leadership incubator. For the city of Detroit. Okay. Um, when 60% of your kids are coming home and, and they can come home and say, well, I grew up by Northwestern, but now I'm working downtown, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that's a powerful position to be in, man. You know, okay. when, when you grow up in this hood and now you're serving in this hood, you know, that's that's a priceless conversation. No hipster can move to the city and fill that shoe, that pair of shoes. You right. know, right. We, we're glad you're here because right. you come with some fantastic ideas. But when you need that person who can connect the innovation to the neighborhood situation, mm-hmm. that's us. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you need Detroiters, born and bred Detroiters to do that. So. And do you think that we have enough of them, don't have enough of them? How do we get more of them? Because, I mean, you always hear the people say, well, downtown is flourishing, but uh, what about the neighborhoods? And yeah. as you ride around, you see it. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's disproportionate. So I think, yeah, so to answer your question, I think there can always be more okay. inclusion. I, I'm, not the, I'm not the brother who's just quick to say we're being left out. Even though there's some fact to that statement, you mm-hmm. know, there is a population of the city that kind of looks at the city as this blank canvas. And that's offensive. Yeah. Because we've been here. Right. <laughs> right. And, and right. And you hear that all the time. All the time. It's a blank canvas. Exactly. So no, wait a minute. Where's the shout out to to the mothers and the fathers and the uncles and big mamas who literally held this piece down? Yeah. When, when it was when, nothing. When it was nothing. Yeah. You know, you know, the barbershops and the, the small businesses. 60% of the small businesses in the city are, are, are still African-American owned. Mm. So you cannot come in and say it's a blank canvas without offending more than half the city. Okay. So I, I believe we should stop that conversation. However, I think those of us who have been here mm-hmm. should also make the concerted effort to find value in some of the parts of the city that we may have taken for granted. Okay. So, for example, I love what I'm seeing on the Avenue of Fashion these days. Yes. You know, that man, that development is... I mean, come on, Six Mile of Illinois is starting to pop a little. Yeah, really? Yeah, y'all building around Nikki D's. <laughs> you know? so, it's like, so it's like, yo, okay, I, I'm I'm sitting here like, okay, you know what? I was asleep a little bit. You know, there there's value in Grandma and and up Grand River, and there's value on Joy Road, and and yes, we should be more involved involved with what's going on downtown. But guess what? We got streets in these neighborhoods that we already own. We got yeah. grass we can already be cutting. We got businesses, buildings we can already buy. And what puts the value in those buildings? Your presence. Yeah. Your investment. Open the business, you know, and, and, and run a good business. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. Which, I'm sorry, like this brings up uh, another thought to mind, how we always talk about black business in the city. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in that. My wife and I are business owners, and, and the poorest customer service I've received per capita has come from non-black business owners. Mm. Okay. So just open a good business and run a good business. That's it. We'll come. Yeah. We'll support it. Yeah. So, yeah, I like it. I think we should be more involved with it. And, and I'm looking forward to us getting more involved with it. You okay. Know? Yeah. All right. Kyrie Turner is in the building, the uh, president, or is it chairman? Yep, executive director. Executive director, yep. okay, of the Coleman Young Foundation. Now, uh, speaking of your music, let's hear a piece. Uh, is this the Black Bottom Collective, this or is this, this something? This is the Black Bottom Collective, yeah. Okay. We're going to throw back to uh, L-O-V-E. Is L-O-V-E. L-O-V-E. Yeah. Let's, let's get uh-huh. that going, and we will hang out and talk a little more with Kyrie Turner on Billy on. T. Detroit Radio. This is a song for the love of your life. Really know what love is. Make sure you say that to yourself twice. I think I do. And on the third verse, say it thrice. And it works for what you're going through. We're gonna define this. I'm gonna define it for you. I was told that love carries me over. Love saves souls. Love fed me, clothed me, raised and composed me. Love helped an addict regain control. Love called me a man. Love married and chose me. Love has given me challenges, checks and balances. Love even studied and steadied and readied me. Love shot my heart with them without silences. In the presence of pain, love toughened my frame. Now love was the first to tell me truth hurts. And back then love had not duetted with Rakim. Love of God to me is the most attractive. And this black skin's one of the things love's wrapped in. Love told the thug, you're more than society's dregs. You a king if you just know the ledge is the reason to live. Rationale for dying and God is are the only words that can define and say hell. percent of all you do but love is 90 percent of all you are it's like when love is in your life you live a little life little love lively. is a little big thing kind of like ali love is patient and passionate love make a man feed his woman strawberries out of a bassinet and love never dies but love will make you lie down with dogs if your vision is foggy love is the life with x is to sex it'll kill you if it's not put in its proper context love is like day to night dark to light left to right loose to tight does the dynamite it's tenement buildings and Skyscrapers, abject poverty and stacks of paper. The reason to live, rather now for dying and God is are the only words that can define and say L O V E. Bottom line for living says key money. Rearrange life to L O V E and you will L I V E. God did say L O V E. Life of his balance and act of your ass me. The good and the bad, the bound in this way. The greatest gift received from G O D. Come on. Love can improve sex when love asks me if I wanted to bone or connect. Love ain't about like, it's about respect. And I don't like falling in love. I'd rather take steps, cause love hurts like life. But life's all love. That's it's real. like one day you get a push for a shove, but then the next day you're turning vultures to doves. Hermetic law said so below, so above. People amuse me, acting smooth like Osley tunes. When love got ways of turning plums to prunes, and love got ways of turning prunes to pits. If you plant a pit right, it's gonna grow again. Slick new boogie. Love's the greatest come. Back artists and sugar, Otis, recognize, don't blow this. Just cause you lost one time, it don't mean that you're gonna lose again. Love's not what love seems. You live through it cause love said you were strong enough. Right. Love through it and emerge with stronger stuff. It's the reason to live. The reason Rationale to live. for dying and God is all the holy words that can define and say L O V E. Bottom line for living says G O D. Rearrange life to L O V E and you will L I V E. God is. Says G O D, rearrange life to L O V E, and you will L 
The Black Bottom Collective. Kyrie Turner. Yes, sir. And the crew is uh, DJ Carl still with you? Everybody, man. All DJ right. Carl, my wife. Uh, yeah. Shout out to my wife, Tanisha. Uh, yeah, everybody. Karen, Kamal. Ted, yeah. All right, yeah. man. We're grown and, and, and we got babies, but well, we're still banging, man. Hey, it's Detroit. Stay yes. low keep moving. and keep moving. <laughs> that's the mantra. That's, that's it, that's baby. That's the mantra, brother. Stay low and yeah. keep moving. Yeah. Uh, Kyrie Turner, our special guest uh, in the studio. We were expecting another guest. We'll get him in at another time. Indeed. But right now we got Kyrie in here. Yes, and yes. I wanted to ask you, man, you, you mentioned being in front of 3,000 people doing the TED Talk at yeah. Fox Theater. Yes, sir. How nervous were you? Were you nervous or did you say, boom, I got this? I was. Because you looked a little nervous. Brother. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> I was extremely nervous. I, I, I didn't tell anybody. Uh -huh. you oh, know, you can't. No, right. no. You know, you got to be a pro about it, man. But it was the audience factor. What you saw on that video, mm -hmm. like the slides that popped in, uh -huh. that's what I saw. Oh, okay. I didn't have any, uh, no cheat sheet, brother, nothing. They don't allow it. So okay. You have to, uh, and I had eight minutes. So I had to. Take, you did it, yeah. It was about eight minutes long. Yeah, yeah I had about eight minutes to mm -hmm. put a a political history that was almost a half century yeah. long. Yeah. In, in context, minutes. and like I said in the talk, it was like it was like feeding a tic tac to a net. Yeah. <laughs> you know, trying yeah. to pull that off. Yeah. But it, it took a lot of preparation, and and the nerves just came in from the fact that I'm used to being an extemporaneous speaker. Exactly. You know, I'm an MC, so you yeah. know, you want me to freestyle? Let's go. But in this context, you couldn't do that. You had to prepare. Mm -hmm. So I had to spend a month, man. Uh, me and my brother Lamumba Reynolds. You know, we uh, we spent a practicing. month practicing, practicing, putting the slides together, timing it, timing it again. So yeah, when when D Day came, it was like, and then and then I went the day before, and I got a chance oh, to see walk other the stage people. and stuff. Or yeah, oh, you saw other people do theirs. Yeah, saw so all the people do it. Oh, everybody did. Everybody do like a live rehearsal. Yeah, if you if they, it was the option was there if you okay. wanted to. So okay, you know they give you a chance to do a run through, kind of walk the stage, get get, a, and that's important from, yeah. a perform, from a performer's perspective. Okay, you want to know your stage a little bit. Okay, you know, don't don't blind date that kind of a an event. So oh, okay, um, it was deep, and and I saw a couple of people's nerves get the best of them the day before. Mm -hmm. And some of these folks were like CEOs of companies and things like that, and they just weren't accustomed to that audience. No. That, no. that's that stage is, is it's a it's a big deal yeah. it's a big deal brother but you know for for public speaking these days that is the direction that the genre has gone in okay. because most of us are accustomed to getting some kind of visual aid with something that we read or listen to there there has to be some entertainment value yes you know, it does. even they even got screens in churches so yeah <laughs> you know when yeah. you when you get in that environment it's like it's go time. No, no more. Just you know. And another thing I'd like to mention, you know, right? You, no. And you, like you say, you only have so much time to do it. And I've, and I've watched a couple of TED talks, and some of them are comical and whatnot. Yeah. But you did. You got everything in that you could in that period of time. Yeah. Uh, but the TED talk is a big deal to be able to do one of those things, brother. It's it's, it's awesome. First of all, to to be connected to the brand is an honor. Well, yeah. for those who don't know what a TED talk is, just give us a little history so, of it. So TED's an acronym. It stands for Technology, uh, Entertainment, and Design. Okay. And and the whole concept of the TED talk is to uh, present new ideas to mm -hmm. new audiences. Okay. So there is no boundary uh, or no limitation to who can uh, present a TED talk, and that's why when you go to a TED event, you get Everyone from CEOs to poets to artists. Housewives. Housewives. How do you get chosen to do a TED Talk? You ask. Oh. So, so you know, shout out to Terry Bean, um, who was working, and, and to uh, uh, Charlie Wahlberg, who worked with the uh, TEDx Detroit crew, mm -hmm. the locally produced crew. Um, you can start a TEDx Detroit or a TEDx. The X is, is the representation of the local version. Oh, is TED. that right? Yeah, okay. TEDx, just think. This is for your city. So TEDx Atlanta, TEDx Detroit. Okay. Um, you can start one if there's not one happening in your city. Mm -hmm. So so Charlie, in, in his infinite wisdom, started one uh, with, with his team years ago, I think seven, eight years ago, and it grew, grew, grew into the Fox. And uh, those who want to get on that stage and speak uh, simply need to engage the application process. I think it the application always launches in the summer. You just have to have a fresh idea that, is challenging. Hmm. The key is, you know, you, you're not supposed to be safe in a TED Talk. Oh, really? Which is why, you know, hey, let's talk about Coleman Young to start the day. Uh -huh. You know, so. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to ruffle a few feathers, huh? Oh, man. So, like, yeah, like, let's let's make people uncomfortable. And, and I think that's what they go for. You know, in the church, they call it divine discontent. 
they want to make force the audience to stretch their boundaries and stretch their thinking. You went from my presentation to a woman who had who gave a presentation on sound waves that are used to cure cancer cells. Oh. It was alcohol. You know, wow. her, her presentation was just like, wow. you know, um, and, you know, you go from that to a, a woman who does this artistic presentation where she takes like a, a, the cutout of a bottom of a trash can and rigs it somehow, man, and puts some smoke in it and starts throwing smoke rings all over the audience. You know, it's, it's, it's all cold, man. The stuff that you see oh, wow. in just one day, the idea is it really gives you like renewed faith in people's ability to stretch okay. cognitively, okay. you know. Uh, you just uh, kind of sit back like, man, like black, white, purple, yellow. We some bad people, man. Human beings <laughs> are just some just dope, man. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the things we come up with are just really ridiculous. You know, <laughs> Mama Shoe was there. She presented, you know, she talked about what she did in Highland Park with the house. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and how she transformed the neighborhood, man. And uh, Satori Shakur. Mm-hmm. Uh, from uh, Twisted Storytellers, you know, she was there. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? So you had all these yeah. people, my boy Mike E, Mike Ellison. Mike E, man, yeah. Mike did his thing. He came through with Africa. He did a poem and then banged out a set, you know, in, in 15 oh, he, minutes. Oh, he's going to put it together. Oh, that's I my, know his you know, was tight. Yeah, you Mike know, E Mike is my man. Play. Yeah, that, that's you, a good you brother. You want production? Get, put Mike on stage, <laughs> yeah. you know. So yeah. Mike did his thing, man. It was, it was really cool to see. You know, you had young poets, you know, everybody, man. Chop Shop uh, founders, man. It was They had a cat... Who took a chop shop and started taking um, t- started taking classic cars mm-hmm. and turning them into the. I mean, for us, it, it was like you know, pimp my ride. Okay, but for the masses at large, it was it was a new concept. And his presentation was hot. You know, okay. Detroit cat. You know, my understanding is that he got looked at for a reality show behind that talk. Wow. So oh, wow. things do happen behind the TED talks for a things lot of people. Things happen behind the TED talks, man. Sometimes yeah. it's just one moment in time, and other times it turns into other things because yeah. so many people see it. Yeah. You know, yeah. So yeah. for me, the distinct honor was just being getting an opportunity to, to talk about the mayor. Well, speaking of the yeah. mayor, because mm-hmm. I know you are fond of Coleman Young. I'm fond of Coleman Young. We yes, grew sir. up under his reign, yes, sir. so to speak. What is the legacy of Coleman now? I think when you look at the fact that Detroit has not had to deal with. Let me see if I put it bluntly. We have our issues in terms of law enforcement, but the Black Lives Matter movement has not had to come knock on our door. Okay. That's because it did it in 67. Right. And Mayor Young came in and made sure that the police force looked like the community is served. Yes. Didn't make it all black, but before he became mayor, it was Mm 80-20, white to black. Mm -hmm. He made it Mm 50-50. He was the first mayor in the history of Detroit to make sure that his own administration was uh, 50-50, 50% white, 50% black. He appointed more women. Okay. to uh, appointed positions mm-hmm. in the mayoral administration than any other mayor who had come before him. He also went so far as to make sure that whenever he appeared in public, he always had in his security detail one black man and one white man. <laughs> he was serious about it, okay. man. Um, when you drive down East Jefferson and you look at that Chrysler plant that was there, yeah, think back 30 years to what was there. Nothing. Old Dodge, Maine, it was shut down. Yeah. Um, and remember, that was a time when the people actually necessarily weren't feeling Mayor Young because he wanted to clear that entire community to build the Chrysler plant. And he he got a lot of flack from it. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned these things in your talk. You mentioned Joe Louis Arena. Yeah, Joe uh, Louis Arena. That he came up under his uh, purview and also yeah. the Renaissance Center. It, the Renaissance Center. We forget yeah. that. The Renaissance Center, man. Yeah. Um, um, the People Mover was supposed to be what the M1 is today. Uh-huh. And, and he ended up settling for that People Mover plan. You know, so Joe Louis Arena... The Red Wings were on their way out, out to Oakland County. And I always, you know, take time to say, you know, I'm never mad at a business decision. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if, if you're acting in the bi- in the best interest of your organization. But he was the one who had the foresight to say no city can be viable if its sports franchises do not call the city that they're named after home. Yeah. So when the Pistons left, he was heated. Okay. You know, but he didn't have a plan to keep the Red Wings. There was no plan for Joe Louis Arena. He went and found $5 million in the city's budget, <laughs> earmarked it enough just so he had enough money to dig a hole. Mm-hmm. And that's what he did. He dug the hole. And then he he asked the Red Wings organization to listen to one more pitch, mm-hmm. and they bought it. Mm. And that's how, they, that's how the Red Wings ended up calling Joe Louis Arena home. Wow. Now, what do you think about Coleman Young the second with his son? Coleman Young ready? Jr.? Yeah. You know, he, how do you he's think a, that's going to work? I don't know how it's going to work. You know, I um. So my disclaimer is that Coleman Young Foundation is the only non-political thing the mayor did. But I've met Senator Young. I think he's brilliant. I think yeah, he's, he's a smart, a smart man. guy. He and, really is. And good in, guy. Good yeah, man. 
And he's a, he is. He's a good guy. And I think he's in for a tough race because I think I personally think Mayor Duggan is a brilliant guy, mm-hmm. you know, but and they both have their own path. So it, it's going to be an interesting race. I will say this. I believe that Detroiters are way more intelligent than we've been given credit for historically. Mm-hmm. You can't these days. I don't think you can come in the city and run a campaign on race. Yeah, you can't do it. There's, I think we, we're probably past that. We're now. past that. We, yeah. we we've seen good and bad on both sides of the fence. We want to see. We want to see development, progress, and we want to see it stretch from Eight Mile to the river yeah, and and all points east and west. You know, that's what we want to see. Mm -hmm. We want to see the best interests of Detroit and Detroiters seen to. So from that standpoint, I think it's going to be a tough race because, you know, two years ago we were saying where's the neighborhood plan and now there is a neighborhood plan in place. You know, there is development taking place in neighborhoods. So. It's it's really just going to be a matter of seeing if the plan that you're presenting to the people beats the plan that is already there. Okay. You know, so I, w- I wish, you know, I wish both candidates well. You know, they've both uh, they've both spoken publicly and in support of Coleman and Young Foundation and the work we do. And I won't front, brother. I'm I'm uh, sitting back kind of happy that I can focus on the kids and go to whoever the mayor is going to be and say, we need you to partner with us. Okay. And put these babies through school to make sure that we have Detroiters contributing to Detroit. But uh, but just getting back to your question, TJ, I don't want to sound like I'm dodging it. <laughs> uh, he's a he's a brilliant guy, man. He's he's a brilliant guy, and he comes from he gets it honest. He comes from brilliant stock. Um, so you know, I, I wish him the best. Yeah, oh, yeah I was just asking because I hear you know people saying different things. They only he only running because of his, his daddy name. name and all of that other thing. So yeah, but, you know, the, and that's the thing. You know, we people we love to speculate, don't we? Yeah, right. you know, yep. that's like. Yep. Where does that that really gets us nowhere? Um, so, I'm like, let's let's not speculate. Let's let's look at the facts. Let's let's look at their records. Let's listen to um, what he has to say. Let's, let's see where the chips fall. And for once, for God's sakes, everybody, vote for the person who is going to put the city's best interests first. That's there right. it is. You know? That's right. Kyrie Turner in the studio, Billy yes, T. Detroit Radio. Let's go back to some of your music. Yeah. Uh, the Black Bottom Collective. What? Are, yeah. Is this Detroit Village? Um, so. Yeah, this is Detroit. It's a side project, Book Cadillac. Me okay. and Mark Swami Harper. Shout out, Mark. Um, this is a tribute to Detroit and a tribute to Dilla. You'll hear it in the sound. All right. Yes, sir. Kyrie Turner on Billy T. Detroit Radio. I guess I should explain myself. Come on. One. One, two, one, two. This is for that feeling that anybody from Detroit gets. Whenever they're in that state of mind where they're representing that city. Let's go. Stab Motor City, state of mind. Feet on the gas. Grand National, Grand River, off Grand. Half the joints vacant when I drive past. Make my city look sad. But Detroit ain't that bad. She just a rehab. That mean every now and then the city relapse. But get a D-dab. Dog, be bad. How you talk about the D-black? I ain't preaching to y'all. I'm spitting these facts. Need some people in the D to get the streets back. You doing what you gotta do, dude, I see that. But when you do your thing, that's where my seeds at. That's where my family and my elderly at. Them little kids see your pain, go through it, grow to it. Then they gravitate and run conquerors. Gotta speak truth to it. Ain't gotta be the saint, but only you can save Detroit. The world ain't look. We used to say swole, now we say what up, though. We still the same folk. Somebody changed, though. We used to say swole, now we say what up, though. We still the same folk. Somebody changed, though. We used to say swole, now we say what up, though. We still the same folk. Somebody changed, though. Sugar is sugar and salt is salt. You ain't get off today, dog. It's not my fault. Yes, y'all. It's Detroit Mish. Hip you to my city, put you up on that ish. Home of Coney Island, you buy we fry fish. Appetizer of the chili cheese fried dish. Neighborhoods might put your body at risk. Let your block clubs organize and don't promote this. Right. Up south, everybody got a little miss. Obama, Carolina, folk who came to work shifts. Up in plants where we manufacture whips, you grip. And Chandler Park, Rouge, or maybe Bell Isle strips. We drive because we got bad, fast transit. So brothers got bellies and the ladies got hips. Hollywood call it fat, but Detroit call it thick. That's how we like it, talking at them two clicks. We see it every day. We know they like a trip, but we descend we got zip ends, look. We used to say swole, now we say what up, though. We still the same folk, somebody changed, though. We used to say swole, now we say what up, though. We still the same folk, somebody changed, though. We used to say swole, now we say what up, though. We still the same folk, somebody changed, though. Sugar is sugar and salt is salt. You ain't get off today, dog. It's not my fault. Come on. MCs, no, I'm 
hairstylists, throw them up. Throw them up. Barbershops, throw them up. Throw them up. And preachers, throw them up. Throw them up. Imams, throw them up. Throw them up. Athletes, throw them up. I know it's crazy, but that's Detroit. We unique like that. Home of America's first free indoor malls, share crop of skins with cribs and backyards, church and a mosque, couple on every corner, so you can get your hum to lie on a hallelujah, we country on the east, crispy on the west, and wild all over, keep a heater, a vest, a low jack, a dog, preferably a pit, and that friend who gets tricky with a po-po stick, gon' stick with my city, speak love to it, truth to it, build it up, put a root to it, cause it's used to it, get fly with it, throw paint where it ain't, and I can talk about Detroit, your ass can't look, we used to say swole, now we say what up though. We still the same folk, somebody changed though. We used to say squo, now we say what up though. We still the same folk, somebody changed though. We used to say squo, now we say what up though. We still the same folk, somebody changed though. Sugar is sugar, sugar and salt is salt. You ain't get off the day, dog. It's not, not my, my fault. fault. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Where yeah, that little, uh, state of mind. Where that come from? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Shout out Nat Morris. <laughs> All right. Kyrie Turner is live in the studios. Billy T. Detroit Radio, WCHB AM 1200 and 99.9 FM. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for stopping by, Tyree. Brother, Kyrie. thank you, man. Uh, so, speaking of the music, what is happening with your music now? You say the, you got the band back together? Yeah, man. We uh, we took a we took a break um, uh-huh. and, that turned and, and into a nine-year hiatus. Had to live life a little bit. <laughs> we had to live life, man. So, you know, we came back together. Um, uh, whenever, I, whenever I put a crew back together, I have this little group text that I send out, man. It just says, Avengers Assemble. All caps question mark and uh, about like a year that. ago, thank you, man. Uh, about a year ago, I was I was really just missing the cats, man. You know, we had all gone off and started families, uh, started businesses, and it was cool that ev- that I knew that everybody was doing well mm-hmm. and was healthy and and happy or relatively happy, man. And um, I sent that text out, man. Within five minutes, I not only, I not only got responses, but I pretty much got lightweight cussed out by my band. It was like, <laughs> where you been? Where you think? Where you been? You know, it's like, uh, so we we did this like amazing reunion show uh, last last summer, brother, and we purposefully did it like in, in a very grimy fashion, man. We uh-huh. went, uh, we did it over at the Tangent Gallery, Hastings uh-huh. Street Ballroom, hence the connection to Black Bottom. Okay. And, we did like a Sunday day party because we were like, you know, okay, at this part in life, at this point in life, when do we want to gig? Exactly, w- with enough time to get back and get the kids, get the kids to bed. So, um, <laughs> grown man, folk style. It was grown yeah. folk style, brother. We uh, we packed the house, man. We ended up having to turn some folks away, uh-huh. and we just decided, you know what? Okay, this this is more than a reunion. This mm. is a reuniting, you know. So okay. now, man, we just perform when the opportunity arises. So, mm. um, you know, shout out to. Uh, Shahida Mausi and Suleiman Mausi over at Shane Park and the Wright Productions. They uh, uh, they have uh, tapped us to share the stage with Layla Hathaway. Oh, August sixteenth. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. So every man in the band is like going gaga over that <laughs> one, you know. So. <laughs> Thank you, Shahida. Um, and my wife is like, "How you feel about it?" You know, so oh, baby, ain't I'm no like, thing. I'm like, "Oh, baby, you know, she's, she's an amazing <laughs> artist." <the> band. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's gonna be cool, man. We um don't play anywhere consistently, man. We just enjoy the music. Yeah. You know, it's like let's let's celebrate this legacy, and then as new music comes, you know, we'll jump on it. So there are no plans for a new Black Bottom Collective album or anything at this point. We're just celebrating that stage show because that stage show was the bomb. Fire, man! Um, I mean that, and and now we get to rock in front of our kids. Yeah. You know? So that's man, that's the best, man. You know, my my son is walking around knowing like the lyrics to man, half He must my be album. about what three now? He's Four. three. Three. Okay. Max yeah. is three, man. You know, go to bed, boy. You should be taking a <laughs> nap right now. But uh, yeah, like literally, he by the time we had that show last year, he knew half of the Black Bottom Collective's wow. catalog. You know, wow. And, and he was just, you know, I think I posted something on Facebook where he was like listening to the beginning of L.O.V.E. and started bobbing his head. And <laughs> da, 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 da. And, you know, and it's cool, man, because your, your kids are in that sponge like stages oh, yeah. of their lives, man. So, you know, we're, we're turning them on to all this history and all this music, man. And, you know, they're running around singing everything from uh, BBC to New Edition to, you know, and, and, and so on to, to cats that are hot today. So I'm I'm just glad to be rocking with my cats again. Man. There you go. And it's every original member. That's there you go. You know, did you right. did you watch the new edition movie? Did y'all you man, put you in some kind of way with that? Brother, not only did I watch it, man, my son knows the word. He he's not speaking like full out yet. Uh-huh. He knows every word to Candy Girl. <laughs> it's, it makes no sense, man. That's you know that. Now nah, we we did watch it, man. Actually, that gave me a, a newfound respect for them. Yeah. 
a new addition, man. man. I'm like, those boys been through some stuff, man. Ooh, haven't they? Yeah, haven't they, man? You know, so by the time the Temptations told their story, half the band had passed on. Yeah, you know, these cats can still get out and gig, you and, know, and yeah, and reap some of the benefits and reap some of the be- like. I want to hear a new new edition album now. You know, you go on YouTube and you know their old videos have you know two million views, twenty six million views, and I'm like, that's how it should work. Yeah, that's how yeah. it should work. Yeah. So yeah, I, man, TJ, I was I was really excited. Okay. When that happened. Right. I think know. a lot of people did get it, yeah. it, it was nostalgic, but it was also like, wow, these are the kids we grew up watching and listening to. And, and now look at them and they're still around doing their thing. You know, does it does it trip you out, man? When you when you look and say, wow, it's like we're kind of like at that temptation stage now. Not yet. Not yet. Not the temptation. No, we're not dying off yet. Don't kill us off, Kyrie. We're headed there. But dog, I mean, it's like. We well, are, hey, we that's, are there. It's, it's history, like, man. It's life. Yeah, it keeps moving. Seventy three, you know, hip hop. Well, yeah. yeah, man. And and it's funny, man. I did a I did a thing with a uh, with this brother named Dan Charnas a couple weeks ago. Dan was one of the original writers for the Source. Remember, I used to write oh, for the Source. Yeah. And um, he's also one of the executive producers on the Breaks, the VH1 show. Oh, we were just talking about just that. Talking yeah. About mm-hmm. And and cool cat, man. Happens to be married to a sister from Detroit. Okay. And. Uh, he is now a professor at the Clive Davis Music School at uh, oh, wow. in, at New York University. Oh, wow. So he brought a group to the city to do a field project on Jay Dilla. Mm. Yep. And you remember Wajid? Mm-hmm. One of the original members of Slump, Platinum Pie Pipers. You mm-hmm. know, Wajid came through. Uh, my brother, Jamon Jordan, did, did a tour for the group. And then... Uh, I came through and talked about, you know, Detroit music history. And, and these cats spent like a couple days in the city just my Dukes came through oh. and kicked it with them. You know, All so right. I should have started there. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> it was, man, it was it was a beautiful thing. I made an attempt to hook them up with T3 because I was like, you're talking about Dilly. You need to talk to, you know, T3. So, you know, shout out T3. It was cool, man, but I bring Dan up because Dan wrote this book called The Big Payback. Okay. It, it's the history of the business of hip-hop. Mm-hmm. So it's like a hip hop history book told by the numbers. Okay. So it's deep, man, because you get all this information on like, first of all, you get this kind of like perspective on how deep this culture is at this point. Hip hop. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's like you go back to like the late sixties, the early seventies and, you know, Sugar Hill records and, you know, the, the disco era that preceded hip hop, but kind of fueled the passion for the culture and all right. that, man. It, and you, it makes you sit back and realize Ah, uh, this thing is deep that we're dealing with here. You know, and like what we see happening now with cats, you know, with trap music and and, and, and whether you, whether you're the old cat who likes it or dislikes it, it's doing what the culture is supposed to do. Evolve. It's evolving. Yeah. You know, you you shouldn't expect um, everything to stay the same. Yeah, if we're talking rock and roll. I wouldn't expect Eddie Money to sit down with the chain smokers. Okay. And, and necessarily just be able to kick it. They have evolved from what he did. Yeah. But they would, I'm sure, thank him. And you appreciate know? him. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not expecting a little Yachty to sit down necessarily and, and be on the same level as Chuck D, you know, but I'm pretty sure he would show some deference. Well, now there's another conversation. I know, I know, I know that. I know <laughs> okay. that conversation. And I think somebody did talk to him because he said something to the effect of. Yeah. Tupac, uh, like Drake is better than Tupac and all that. But you got to think about a little Yachty and these guys that are coming up. If they're 20 years old, 19 and 20 years old, they have no point of reference because Tupac's been dead for 20 years. Exactly. So they don't, you know, and Biggie's been dead for 20 years. So they don't have that to to, uh, look back on. They didn't grow up listening to that. Nope. They grew up listening to something completely different. Exactly. So they've evolved from that. So I don't I don't fault him for that. That's just life. But I fault the the well us. I mean I, yeah. I fault radio. I fault uh, the old heads for not instilling this in the young heads. Mm-hmm. That hey man, you didn't just start doing this. Right. It didn't start right. with Little Wayne. Right. Okay. It goes back, and we have not well kept said. our culture alive enough. Hip hop to me. I've said this before, apparently to the business of music, hip hop is the only disposable form of music. Mm. They've let they oh we're done with that one. What's next? We're done with that one. What's next? Mm. And we and we cast to cast it aside. They don't do that with rock and roll. They don't do that with R and B. We keep it alive, mm. but we don't keep hip hop alive. And these new uh, allegedly classic hip hop stations ain't doing it either. Nah, okay, nah. and I always felt like it should have been incorporated. In the in the music along the way, yeah, you know, you can't tell me you can't play some of this stuff on the stations that that are are here now. I mean, I don't know if it's too late because the the kids aren't interested; well, they're you know just what? not interested. You make me think about jazz, the way jazz was co opted, exactly. And I think I think the the biggest difference is that in jazz there was a huge absence of ownership. Mm-hmm. You know, so you had cats like Coltrane and walking around, you know, creating this phenomenal music, and they own none of it. 
and hip hop. They own was, it. They own it. A lot, a least, lot of these cats learn the yeah. game and, and learn to own coming into the game. You know, yeah. and that's a, that's an interesting thing that the book kind of highlights that, that Dan wrote, and I shot it out because I didn't realize that hip hop is the culture that broke down the racial barriers in radio. I didn't even realize that that urban radio and, and correct me because you you know you're you're much more of a vet than me, but I didn't realize that urban radio was the last bastion in the United States to openly discriminate between black and white music and, you know, having oh, wait black minute. music Whoa. departments and... and Whoa, wait, no, 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 no. It wasn't urban radio. Urban radio actually had to break down the doors mm-hmm. so that we would have black record reps. If it wasn't for black radio, there would be no black... They sent these white boys in and the PDs were like, hold on, man, hold on, no. This is in the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. And they was like, you seeing somebody in here that know, there's no it's my music. And they had to hire black record reps to come to the black radio stations. We right. had some power. Right. OK, so we created a whole black division right. because of black radio. Uh-huh. OK, but as also as when but I think what, back at about, a younger age, we mm-hmm. used to play music. OK, black radio played Elton John. Black radio played Hall and Oates. Mm-hmm. Black radio yeah. played a lot of pop artists, mm-hmm. you know, before white radio did, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, accepted us. And then that white people, then they started calling it urban. Yeah. Black. Instead of black, it's we urban. urban. So, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they changed. It. Yeah. So see, no, no. Black radio point. did not discriminate. I see your point. I think black radio. No, no, no. I'm not saying black radio discriminated. Oh, OK. I'm saying the, the genre, period. Mm-hmm. The music industry to radio discriminated between black music and white music yeah. as opposed to just recognizing good music. Good music, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's the point that, that I'm making. But but I appreciate that, you yeah. know, because I, I think that should be part of the argument, the presence of black radio reps. The, the thing that I didn't realize was that before hip-hop, in the music industry and, and in the radio industry, there was open discussion and open separation of black music from yeah. white, black yeah. artists from white artists, when on the artistic and creative side... These artists all historically respected one another. Yes, you know. Well, you could, you know, you Run DMC uh, had a lot to do with that. They broke down a lot of barriers they when they did well, Walk This Way with yeah. uh, Aerosmith, yeah. and it and the white kids were like, oh, this is incredible, yeah. and the black kids were like, what is this? It's I like it too, yeah. you know. And <laughs> yeah. and it, it it opened doors and and took rap into the mainstream. Yeah, they yeah, were yeah. definitely yeah. responsible for that. I think yeah. hip hop did a lot of that. Yeah, and uh, and that's a good point. Indeed, very Indeed. good point. Or you know, even even Def Jam they, when they were on profile, but Def Jam. Def Jam Records first producer was Rick Rubin. Yeah, you know the man behind LL's uh, first whole whole first album, Run uh, DMC's first album, and Chuck D. Uh, uh, and, Ch- and Public, Public Enemy. Enemy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of music, let's hear another one of your cuts real ah. quick. Where were you? That's what we're looking for. Where were you? Where, 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 where were, were you, you? There Kenny? There it is. There you go. <laughs> where were you, Detroit? Yes, y'all. Ain't nobody here alone. That's right. We all stand on the backs of people who came before us, right? Tell the truth. Life is something to be celebrated for that fact alone. Where were you when certain things went down? Let's talk about them. My wash is broken. Clothes are matted. I'm slow to fix it. We at the laundromat when invisible two ways me. Hit me to say music lost the legend. Jam master J. My heart plummets. Tunisia looks stricken. I tell her Jay's murdered. She tells me quit kidding. Some patrons hear us. They stop and look. I stare at nothing. Run DMC hooks. Flash through my middle. Can't speak. Mouth dry. Waiting for the psych. I know it's not a lie. This is one of my models. I never met him, but everybody knows somebody like Jay at the cut. I scratch like him. I rap like him. Man, I saw a crush groove and tried to act like him. God's plan ain't mine, but I just wanted to see Jam Master Jam one more time. First time you heard Sucker MC's rock box on his life, that man. First time you saw Jay Scratch on a record with the beaters on his hands. Now that's history, really no mystery. You were there center stage. And you can mark the date with your own experience, write your own page. Now I'm kind of excited, never been to Universal, my job gave us tickets, we all gon' pick it, a pay field trip, the first black circus, is close to my crib, it's time to do my thing, the telephone rings, Swami sounds all excited, saying we be in attack, tells me a plane hit the World Trade Center, people jumping out of buildings and the sky's full of black smoke, I say a prayer hoping it's an accident, arrive at the circus and hear an announcement, saying evacuate, two planes hit the towers, one collapsed terrifically, the other might follow, I get to the crib and find my wife in shock, she says, one fell and the other just dropped She watched thousands die, face full of tears We pray cause we fear Armageddon is near On the day the world's most powerful nation was shaken to its core 
Thank you for listening to the Billy T. Detroit radio broadcast. Follow me on social media at Billy T. Detroit.